that he was actually a woman. It's suspicious that he did, he wasn't always destined for greatness. He kind of worked his way into the Uesugi clan. So he was actually alive. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's totally plausible. You know, the the his, his story is already very poetic as it is, but mm -hmm. it, it'd be even more poetic if he got away. <laughs> with it. And welcome to Let's Ask Shogo. So everyone, the other day I was actually reading uh, this book, The Mystery of Japanese History, to study more about, you know, the history of Japan. And in this book, it actually talks about many mysteries, different theories that we are usually not taught at school, you know, in history class and such. And this book, of course, it talks about a lot of different people, but it also focuses quite a lot on the warlords of the Sengoku period, the Sengoku era. And I was reading it, you know, they were all really, really interesting, but I was wondering, like, okay, so it's very different from what we're taught at school. How would I know, like, how can I confirm how true the stories are introduced in this book? And to be honest, I do more studying about the Edo period and not too much about the Sengoku War era. So I was thinking maybe it'll be really fun if I can ask a friend who knows a lot more about the Sengoku War period than I do. And he is the Shogunate. Yes, so this video is actually going to be my first collaboration video with him. I'm going to be calling him over Zoom and I'd love to ask him about the theories about four warlords that are introduced in this book. Um, and the four warlords are going to be, first, Uesugi Kenshin. Yes, the famous Uesugi Kenshin. Number two is going to be about Akechi Mitsuhide. And number three is going to be about Ishida Mitsunari. And number four is about Tokugawa Ieyasu. All four of the different mysteries and theories introduced in this book are really, really interesting. So I hope you can enjoy this video till the end to find out about all the different theories about them to deepen your understanding towards the Sengoku warlords. So then, how about I call the Shogunin and get started? Then I love to welcome Nick from the Shogunet. Thank you so much, Nick. This hey is there. Awesome. So I'm in Kyoto and you are talking to me from? I'm in, uh, I'm in the United States. I'm, in, I'm uh -huh. in Wisconsin right now. I think this is awesome that we get to talk over Zoom like this. Yeah, thank you so much for your time, Nick. Oh yeah, of course. This is great. Uh -huh. Yes. And I remember, you know, I think it was when I only had like 500 subscribers or something. You, you know, introduced one of my videos. It was oh, yeah. the video where you talked about Yasuke, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, and you introduced one of my videos in your video. You took like almost like, I don't know, about 10 seconds in your video to just talk about me. And, you know, on my wife and all my members at that time, my best friend Kaz, we were like, this <laughs> Shogun and Nick is so awesome, you know? Yeah, and just, we were really, really happy because no one basically at that time cared about us at all. So I had been sharing your uh, your content, of course, yep. through my through my stuff. And I was trying to get your videos out there because you mm -hmm. make amazing videos. And I wanted Thank to really so. try to promote as much as possible. And, and now you're, 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 you're so much bigger than I am with your channel. It's crazy. <laughs> I, I, I grew like that. It's awesome. Yeah, thank you so much. So then before we get into today's main topic, would it be okay if you can give a brief self-introduction of yourself? Yeah, sure. So uh, my name is Nick. Uh, I run a mm -hmm. uh, another YouTube channel called The Shogunate. Um, yes. It's uh, basically, uh, its purpose is to cover samurai history, samurai films, samurai games. And I do a series on the Sengoku period, uh, the, the Sengoku Jidai, the, the Warring States era that I've been doing for several years now. And it's it's mm -hmm. it's got, I think, around 50 some episodes right now. But I try to really kind of go in, in depth and detail the, the major events going throughout the really fascinating period of uh, Warring States in medieval Japan. That's amazing. Yes, I think I especially love your movie reviews. Oh, yeah. You talk a lot about movies that I've never watched before. And I also love the, uh, the episodes where you focus on one a single clan and you talk about mm. the history of a clan. Yeah, like recently you talked about the Oda clan, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like I really love those videos, especially. Yes, you know, kind of my plan to do those after I finished mm -hmm. the, uh, the the series that I'm doing. But I, I really just kind of wanted to jump into these clans that I felt like I didn't have a, enough time to necessarily focus on the history of. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I decided to start jumping into that um, before I finished my series. And on top of that, mm -hmm. 
I'm letting people on my Patreon decide what clients mm. I cover. Oh, that's amazing. All right. So then before we get started, one question from me, by the way. Who would be your favorite uh, single kudaimyo or single warlord, by the way, before we get started? <laughs> it's a really it difficult is. question for you. It is, it is. Kudai, but... I get asked, like, what's my favorite clan? What's my favorite, you know, samurai uh, daimyo? It's really hard because when I think of a daimyo, I always connect it to a clan that I like. Um, mm, so it's it's hard to necessarily pick one, um, but I am a I'm, I'm a major Chimazu fanboy, so I, I would have to probably go with uh, Chimazu mm. Yoshihiro. Oh, really? Okay. Why why Shimazu? I'm I mean, like among all the famous warlords, I'm pretty sure even in Japan, a fan of mm. Shimazu would be quite rare, actually. Yes. Why would you say Shimazu? Yes. Just in general, the, the Shimazu have a really interesting tendency to kind of have this, I don't want to say rebellious mm. nature, but kind of just mm. to put it plainly badass nature, you know, just uh, <laughs> the way they conducted themselves specifically, if you look at, you know, their zillions to uh, mm. the, the Toyotomi when they were coming into Kyushu. Yep. And mm. then later, of course, uh, I think Yoshihiro is one of the kind of unsung heroes of perhaps, you know, Hideyoshi's invasions of, of Korea. And then, of course, mm. later at the Battle of uh, Sekigahara, I think uh, Yoshihiro, of course, he, he does. He, he should get more more attention for being really one of the major figures on the Western Army side of the Battle of Sekigahara, who was competing mm. against the Tokugawa and um, did a lot of, you know, he did his strategy where they retreated through the enemy, which I think is really awesome. So and everyone, if you're interested in the single Kujidai, you could definitely check out Shimazu Clan then. So then, yes, let's get into today's uh, main topic. So number one, I'm going to be starting from Uesugi Kenshin. Uesugi Kenshin in a theory is saying that he was actually a woman. So not a he, actually, it was a she. And in this book, there's actually six claims proof that backs up this theory. Number one, he actually never had a relationship with a woman. And that's very, very strange because in the Sengoku War period, it's very important that you have an heir to carry on your clan, carry on your name. Why would you not have a wife or a lover in some kind? And number two, every month on the 10th or 11th, he quit going out to the battlefield somehow saying that he had a stomach ache. Every time, every, every month on the 10th and 11th, around there, he would say, no, I'm not going out today because I have a stomach ache. Okay, that's a little bit weird too. And number three, as is a, this is really a lot of same for a lot of samurai warlords too. But in this book, it says there were no portraits, no pictures of him written before he died. And number four, there's even a poem talking about Kenshin, saying that he his strength was he had a lot of strength that even a man could not win against. Yes, a unrivaled man's unrivaled superpower is is how they uh, described Kenshin in one of the poems, okay? That's weird to say, if he was a man, you wouldn't say that he, compared to a man, he was very strong, right? And number yeah. five and number six, there's two more. Number five, he was actually adopting a lot of beautiful boys from different families. And for example, the famous uh, Uesugi Kagetora, Kagetora was one of the uh, boys that he adopted, was actually called the Kanto region's most beautiful boy, actually. Bishonen in Japanese. And this is very strange too. Again, he didn't have a lover. He didn't even have a wife. He didn't have his own child. But he suddenly gathered all of these boys from different families and different places and adopted them. And this is very strange because that would eventually could lead to uh, family cores, right? Like, who's going to be the next, you know, the leader kind of thing. Exactly, exactly. And it <laughs> actually did lead to that battle. Why would he do that? It's very strange, right? And why would the people around him allow him to do that, right? And number six, the reason for his death is, well, generally we say it's a stroke, but there's actually a um, historical record called Todaiki, which was written in the Edo period from 1624 to 1644, based on official record of Nobunaga, actually. It was some stories about Uesugi Kenshin as well. And in that book, it says that he died from um, not a stroke, but from heart and stomach pain, which in some theories, some studies say that it might be feminine diseases or Manopause, is it? Yes. Menopause, yeah. 
And a pause, yes. So these are the Sixers. There's a lot of claims, actual proof that backs up the story of Wizzy Kenshin was actually a woman. So Nick, I'd like to ask, have you heard about this theory before? What oh, is yeah. your opinion yeah, about it? Yes. This is one of one of a, one of the popular theories mm-hmm. that uh, I, I often get asked asked about on, oh. on my on my channel. I don't know if I personally believe it. I I I like that they, they listed all, all those. I can kind of I can kind of formed in my head because I have an argument against why he probably was a man, but mm-hmm. I definitely see why people think it, it might be suspicious. Uh, mm-hmm. Could I ask what, what you believe? What I believe? Well, you know, reading this book, you know, right after reading this book, I was, I was totally convinced actually, because mm-hmm. out of the four warlords we're going to be talking about today, this theory has the most number of proofs and evidence. So I was actually pretty convinced. So, I, I guess going down down the list, I, mm-hmm. I guess that the ones that that really kind of seem the most suspicious to me in terms mm-hmm. of you know him him perhaps being a woman, mm-hmm. uh, I guess are are the the idea of him being being celibate. Um, mm-hmm. We know for a fact a lot of a lot of daimyo, a lot of samurai were uh, definitely taking on vows of of being you know more religious, uh, being monks. Mm-hmm. You know the name Kenshin was his Buddhist name. So it oh. it um the fact that he became sort of you know celibate it it it's not too far of a stretch but it it does you kind know, of of course as you mentioned it is suspicious because obviously he would want to have children he would want mm-hmm. to you know mm-hmm. carry on his line the thing about the uh his position is that he was not born into the Uesugi family he was mm-hmm. born uh Nagao uh Nagao Kagetora oh. okay. and uh so it, it's suspicious that he did, he wasn't always destined for greatness. He kind of worked his way into the Uesugi clan. So the idea that he was a woman, it kind of makes you wonder if 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 this was always true, why wasn't this, you know, it, it doesn't make sense going all the way back to his original upbringing in the Nagao clan. Why why would, you know, they be kind of carrying on this, this uh, story for so long? Mm-hmm. But... Going on to your your comments about you know him adopting also so many mm-hmm. people and yes. you talked about Uesugi Kagetora which is funny because mm-hmm. that was also his previous name yep. that he gave to uh, to him uh, that was actually son of Hojo I think it was Hojo yep. Ujiyasu exactly um, that's right and of course Ujiyasu that, that was a whole whole deal with trying to you know preserve peace at that time and and mm-hmm. it, it was mm-hmm. he was a hostage. But you're, you're you're totally totally right that the fact that all these all these children all these all these people that he was bringing in and adopting it was going to cause problems. The big thing that I I don't think you can necessarily argue against is the whole idea of how he you mentioned planned his campaigns or, or stayed away from battle. You know, mm-hmm. every, around that same time every month to kind of you know it, it reflects a woman's period. So it it exactly. makes that that's the the one thing I don't think is necessarily refutable because. It, it it's the most suspicious i feel like in terms of the argument of that he was that he or she was a woman one thing about the sengoku jidai as a whole is really interesting that is that we know today who like in pictures you know who wizu kenshin is or takeda mm-hmm. shingen is right but at that time only a very few amount of people actually knew who like what he looked like like any warlord yeah so because there were no pictures, there were no cameras, you know, at that time. So people have heard of the name Whiskey Kenshin before. Oh, he's a really powerful warlord somewhere in some country, right? But you've never actually seen him before. It was pretty common for each samurai to have like a body double. It's called Kagemusha in Japanese. Yeah, Kagemusha. Like a, Kagemusha, I, I, yeah. you know. Maybe some theories are taken from the the, uh, the characters of the Kagemusha possibly. And these mm-hmm. things could happen too, yes. But I, I really didn't know about on um, what you explained to me about before he became the Uesugi uh, with this name you know before that the, I didn't this book doesn't talk about anything before carrying out the Uesugi name so that was really interesting yeah that's, that's that's one of the reasons I think why he's he's so famous and important is because the, mm. the Uesugi family was so fractured uh before exactly. he kind of came into the, the picture and mm. he was adopted into the family and he essentially took the, took over the entire uh clan mm. and you reunified it and brought it to a new period of strength all oh, right. Oh, this one is really, it's famous, but it's something that's still discussed in Japan today, too. Yes, I think this is mm-hmm. really, really interesting. Well, yeah. if he was actually a woman, it would be really amazing, though. 
how strong, how smart, and how powerful he was, you know. Yeah. And you know his ability to again, you're saying, you know, make the clan so powerful. So that would have been really, really amazing. Yes, I think there's a lot of dreams there, you know. Yeah, yeah. If it was, I, it's it's always always fun to kind of theorize in in terms of you know if such a thing was true, I I know it would make a lot of people really really happy. <laughs> yes, 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 exactly. I love to move on to the second theory I like to introduce today. It's actually about Akechi Mitsuhide. Is of course the very very famous samurai. First of all, that assassinated Oda Nobunaga in the Honnoji incident. If you talk to a Japanese person, it's basically impossible to find a person who doesn't know Akechi Mitsuhide. Basically, what we learn at school is right after uh, Akechi Mitsuhide assassinated Oda Nobunaga, of course, Totem Hideyoshi uh, comes back. You know, runs back to. To the battle, and it leads to the battle of Yamazaki. And his、um, rule, Akechi Mitsuhide's rule, is called、um, Mika Tenka in Japanese, which means he ruled、um, Japan for only three days. It was very, very short.、Sure, yes. So the common theory is that he got killed right after he assassinated Oda. But in this book, it says that he was actually alive after the battle with Totem Hideyoshi, and he actually survived it. And he was. Alive as a high priest, a Buddhist monk called Tenkai. Tenkai. That's the Heaven Oceans, which means.、Mm. Yes. And this priest suddenly came into history in some historical records from 1588. He suddenly showed up, and he was a very important person in the Tokugawa family. That was actually advisor for the second generation、uh, Hidetada and also Iemitsu as well for the Tokugawa family. So why did he suddenly show up? He suddenly showed up in history, and he was powerful enough to suddenly be close to the、um, the second and third generation of the Tokugawa family. How could he suddenly do that, right? So that's one thing. And there's actually four more theories to back this up, this idea up. Number one, Tenkai. He actually had a different name as a Buddhist monk, and he was actually called Jigen Daish. Jigen Daish. But there's actually a temple in Kyoto where I live called the Jigen Temple. And Jigen Temple actually has a monument of Akechi Mitsuhide. So maybe he took the name from the Jigen Temple, or maybe he put the name, his name, into the temple. We don't know, but it's actually just some relationships there. That's number one. Number two, the third generation of Tokugawa,、uh, the Tokugawa family, was Iemitsu. Now Iemitsu's nursery mother, who raised Iemitsu, was actually the daughter of Saito Toshimitsu. Saito Toshimitsu. Now, Saito Toshimitsu was actually a subordinate of Akechi Mitsuhide, who was killed after the Battle of Yamazaki as a traitor. But that's a little bit weird. Why would you let you know, the Tokugawa Iyasu? Why would he let or Iyasu Hidetada? Why would he let a traitor's daughter take care of their son or their grandson? Maybe they. It was because Tenkai or Akechi Mitsuhide was very close. In this book, it says that maybe Tenkai recommended the daughter to be Iemitsu's nursing nursery mother. That's number two. Which I thought that was really interesting. Number three is the famous Hokoji Gong incident. It wasn't really such a big thing, but they、mm-hmm. turned it into a big thing so they can start a fight、right. with the Toyotomi family. Yes, and the reason why it was suddenly a temple and a gong, like it could have been anything else, right? Why suddenly a temple and a gong and a message written there? It was because Tenkai actually led this incident.、Mm-hmm, that's number three,、okay. and number four for me. I think this might be the most interesting、um, claim. The evidence here. There's a shrine called Nikko Toshogu. This is the shrine where Tokugawa Yasu is actually worshipped. What's really interesting is that within this shrine, this very famous shrine called Toshogu, of course there are the kamo, the family crests inside the shrine. But of course,、um, the Tokugawa kamo is the three-leaf holly hawk, Aoi mo, Mitsuba Aoi, it's called. But、um, there are actually some of the kikyo mo, which is the bellflower kamo, in some places inside the Toshogu shrine. Which actually worships Tokugawa Iyasu? Why would they suddenly use Akechi clan's come on、mm-hmm. in a shrine to worship Tokugawa Iyasu? Yes, this is the fourth、uh, evidence that's introduced. And by the way, it also talks about 
It's a little bit weird that Akechi Mitsuhide left so much proof that he was still alive, right? It is said that he wanted to let the uh, future generations know that he was alive until um, the Totomi family completely died out and lost their power, actually. So he actually saw that before he died. And Tokugawa family too, of course, keeping Tenkai, or in other words, Akechi Mitsuhide really close to their family and to their clan, there was a risk, right? But again, it was because, first of all, Ake um, Akechi Mitsuhide was very smart a powerful strategist. So they wanted to keep him by their side. That's number one. And also he actually, of course, helped the Tokugawa family to get rid of Ono Nobunaga. So that is the reason why both sides, Akechi Mitsuhide and Tokugawa family, they both um, had the risks of keeping you know, each other close. But it's explained in this book, it, that was the reason why. So these are the four evidence to back up this story. But what do you think? You've been talking a lot about Akechi Mitsuhide in movie reviews and oh, yeah. video games and such, but what would you think? It's it's interesting because this is actually a story I probably, out of out of the four that we're going to be talking about, this is probably mm -hmm. the one I know probably the least about, but I'm, I'm fascinated really? to hear about it. I, I, I did look up, you know, I, I tried to dig into it a bit more um, uh -huh. earlier, and Mitsuhide is such a fascinating figure. Uh, and it it really would be interesting if he if he did go on like this. The idea that that he went on and survived after, after the battle of uh, Yamazaki, mm -hmm. uh, I think is totally plausible because mm. the, we're, we are obviously told that he was killed um, after the battle while he was yep. fleeing, killed mm -hmm. by uh, some uh, perhaps some looters or or mm -hmm. so, some band of, of low That's life. That's the common uh, theory. Yeah, yeah, you know, caught him, cornered him. But the idea that he got away and would go on to be a monk, I, I think, is totally plausible. And the fact mm -hmm. that he would go on to work with the Tokugawa, I think, is also extremely plausible. We have yep. to remember that uh, Tokugawa Ieyasu was not a friend of Hideyoshi, um, mm -hmm. at least, <laughs> at least not, not, you know. And in in the years following um, Nobunaga's death, of course, they would actually fight and butt heads, and Hideyoshi mm -hmm. was always mm -hmm. very suspicious of Ieyasu. So the idea that uh, Mitsuhide would, would, of course, work work with them, I think makes perfect sense. Um, mm. it, it definitely would be something I could I could see being very truthful. It, it's it's one of those stories where I feel like if something were to be revealed, like mm -hmm. it's some, you know, archaeologists were to find something or, or something would be discovered and that this, mm -hmm. this would be, you know, re revealed to be truthful. It it would be very both surprising and unsurprising that something like this actually did did, you know, happen. Mm. Yes, 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 yes. I thought this was really, really interesting. Because, you know, again, if you ask a Japanese person, they would absolutely say that Akechi Mitsuhide died after the, right after the Honnoji incident. And especially, um, I think it's really interesting is the Nikko Toshogu, the shrine where Tokugawa mm -hmm. Yes is worshipped. You can yeah. go there today and actually see the Kikyo Kamon, right? Yeah, the Bellflower mm -hmm. Kamon there. Why would they actually, you know, of course the Tokugawa families um, laid out strict rules about the Mitsuba Awe Kamon, right? They had a lot of rules, they restricted the, but on the other hand, they let the people use the chrysanthemum crest you know, freely yeah. and they kind of tried to take away the power from the imperial court and such. So they were, they must have been really strict with handling their Kamon, the family crest, and suddenly put in the Kikyomon, the bellflower common, in such an important shrine that yeah. enshrines basically on um, worships Tokugawa Yasu. I thought it was really, really interesting. The, yes. the, the only other explanation for that, that that I could think of would, would yeah. be that there was some other samurai at the time who had mm -hmm. who maybe had that as as a as a as a common for his family or something that maybe could have been instrumental in, in setting up the shrine but i it, it, that would be such so outlandish in in comparison to somehow it being connected to mitsuhide that i, exactly. I don't understand why it wouldn't be somehow connected to mitsuhide exactly exactly although i i do want to ask what yeah. do, do you yeah. personally believe this this uh this theory that he got away or what do you think um I would actually say that I would want to believe that this is true. <laughs> yes. Yeah. This is really, really interesting. I mean, because as you were saying, Akechi Mitsuhide is just such an amazing person, a warlord mm -hmm. at this time. And it's just really sad to think that he just got, you know, so easily killed by just some bandits on, you know, as he was fleeing away from the battle. I would be definitely be more excited if this story was true. Yeah, yes. I, I Considering so much that he achieved before it, you know, yeah, suddenly, you know, assassinated Nobunami just being killed after a few days. Mm, I would think it's a little bit sad if he actually died that easily. 
Yeah. So I would want to. I would, I would say I want to believe in this theory. Yes. You know, the the his story is already very poetic as it is, but mm -hmm. it, it'd be even more poetic if he got away. With it. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That would be a, literally even more making the legend right. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. that would be really really cool. I would say. Misnadi actually ended his own life to follow his friend who helped him. He was actually killed in the Battle of Osaka. What do you think? It just doesn't make much sense at all. He ate too much sea bream tempura. I, I totally believe it could be possible. The, the fact that he got so close makes it, makes it incredible. Exactly, exactly, yeah. exactly.